This is the PR Podcast, a show about how public relations helps you tell your story to the world. We talk with great PR practitioners who have the skills, creativity, and just plain savvy to get their clients noticed. Now here's your host, Jody Fisher. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the PR Podcast. I'm Jody Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Well, you haven't got yourself your PR Podcast plug yet, have you? Have you? I know. I'm looking at you. There's only been a handful of people that have sent in their PR Podcast plug, and it is um, built for just for us, right? Because I'll speak for myself as a PR person, great at promoting my clients, horrible at promoting myself. Um, and so we created this as a space, a safe space. Uh, <laughs> what a space to let you give yourself a little bit of love and to let us love on you as well. Um, send us your passion project. You know, what do you love to do in your spare time that gets your juices flowing? Maybe you play the guitar. Maybe you cook. Uh, maybe you wrote a book. Maybe you won an award. Maybe you've got a killer blog or a newsletter or a TikTok channel. Share it with the community here. Send us a, a DM to either the PR podcast socials or my socials at Jody Fisher, uh, or even an email to me, Jody at JodyFisherPR.com. But one way or another or another, send us your PR podcast plug so we can mention it at the top of an upcoming show. We would love to give you, here's that phrase, some free press. <laughs> I, love, I love that, right? All right, and he's and he's already ready to go now. So now let's get into our guest for today. Justin Siggins is a former journalist, hey, just like me, who founded Proven Media Solutions to help great clients get their message through the cacophony of media noise. He's a writer too, right? Listen to that. <laughs> he and his team specifically seek out clients which have strong marketing and branding teams and strategies in place because as he says, press and PR is good, but surround sound marketing and branding is better. Dustin, welcome to the PR podcast. Jeez, Jody. I'm already tired listening to you, man. I got four kids under five here and you're tiring me out. Uh, that That is amazing to me. I have two of my own and they are, you know, teen, preteen. Uh, I remember those days, but I cannot imagine doing four. How do you do that, man? <laughs> uh, I don't have time to write a book or all those other things you were talking about. My PR plug is I actually was going to go, I'm going to go for a bike ride as soon as we're off the air. Wow. Okay. There you go. You got to do something to clear the head, right? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit about your business first, Proven Media Solutions. What do you guys do? Sure. So we've been around for about five years and we... We were started because I've been doing freelancing for years prior to that. And I was really tired of watching, especially in politics, people with bad ideas get more attention than people I knew who had good ideas, but no budgets. And so I started my firm. And what I quickly realized is the reason these people didn't have any budgets is because they didn't have any planning or strategy or infrastructure. And so over the last few years, uh, we've really narrowed our focus from trying to be, you know, surround sound marketing and branding. Like I actually used to talk like that until I realized that everyone says that. Everyone talks like that. So we've really narrowed our niche to a set of five services, press releases, op-eds, interviews, and the like. And we just tell everybody, we are industry neutral, service experts. And, that, and, this, is the, and this is the service we provide. That's great. It's a really smart approach, too. I mean, I, I think uh, we were talking a little bit before the show Um you know, baseline PR people and baseline uh, PR companies will, you know, either write your press release or, or write your press release and send it out or, you know, get you in the newspaper, quote, unquote. Um, and that's kind of like the end of their deal. How do you approach the work that you do for your clients and what do you load into the package that you give them? Sure. So we've actually started building a lot of infrastructure this year. We're still a pretty small team. And a lot of what we do, I never worked at an agency. I never worked as a junior comms person for a, a larger entity. So most of what I've learned is self-taught or taught through coffee, you know, with people who founded their firms long ago. And so this year, we really started building out what was in my head. So always, you know, my political clients, I have a few connections left from my journalism days. Hey, can you link this? Or, hey, you know, can you guys republish this? But now that we're in the business side, we have a lot more business clients. I don't have those connections. I don't have that same, you know, in my head. So what we've started realizing is that that idea is now part of our normal process for all of our clients. We get a, a good interview. We get an op-ed placed. 
or we get a press release that gets you know uh, partly republished or published at a reasonable outlet, we then try to get it backlinked, try to get republished. We will send it out to you know, we, uh, a tailored list of newsletters that we develop with every single placement. And that's it. That's, that, that's what we do. We try to get a few extra links, a few extra backlinks. But the other thing that we'll do that isn't really, we don't charge for it, we will meet with your social media team. We're not social media experts. We're not SEO experts. We're not website content experts. But we can say, hey, this is what we're seeing out there. This might work out well. And by the way, you can't get the greatest value out of your press if you're not using it for all of your marketing channels. And that's why uh, for the bio I wrote for you, I, I wanted to finish out by saying PR is fine. PR is good. Press is good. But surround sound marketing and, and branding is better because that's the modern world. A Washington Post article only lives really for four days or three days or a week, whatever the number is, unless you get it republished, unless you use it in your newsletter and all those other things. So we really try to help yeah. our work with clients who have that in place to with whom we can create that nice rapport for greater value. Yeah, hundred percent with you. And I'm uh, of the same mind that uh, I'm always telling my clients, you know, that the the media hit is great. Now you got to merchandise it. You've got to spread it around. You can't just assume that even your stakeholders who are engaged with you, engaged with your message, um, are going to see it. You need to kind right. of shove it in their face, right, in the form of yep. putting it on your social, which again is very baseline, but you got to do it putting right. it in your newsletter, putting it in your news section on your website. And I am still shocked at how many people don't have a news and or press section on their website. Um, yep. In addition to just merchandising the hard work that they've put in to get the earned media hit, um, it also has terrific SEO value. So I, I, it, it's another thing that you've got to do. So great to hear you tell that story. Really interested in, in how you're pursuing backlinks, because I agree with you that those are those can be the holy grail of marketing uh, and SEO value. Um, and, uh, you know, many I've had a conversation with many a client um, that wonders why, as an example, the New York Times won't link to my website. I'm like, well, and I give them the explanation. Um, right. But you pursue backlinks through newsletters. Give us, give us uh, the 411 on that strategy. Sure. So we will, we just actually started implementing this, just full disclosure. This is a new service we're offering in the last couple of months. We, again, we did it kind of in a haphazard way, but now it's a more systematic process as of late, where if we get something on a policy matter into, I don't know, the messenger, it's a relatively new outlet, but they have, they have a pretty decent uh, op-ed section. So we get that into the messenger. Well, then we're going to contact Rickler Health because it was, I think we did re this recently. We had a healthcare piece. We contact Rickler Health and Rickler Policy. Two backlinks at well-read sites with a target audience of high-level political people. We also um, have a newsletter, uh, uh, excuse me, a list of political people who we know agree with the client's message. Hey, there's seven outlets in this group that we know republish. And you know, I think we got three republishings out of it or two republishings. And for you know, now we are also building tailored lists every single time. So healthcare policy, everything from, I think our, our list that Sen we did today was everything from the Washington Post, Health 202, all the way down to specific trade outlets. Because we got a piece published about SNAP the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. And that's what's going on the Hill right now. So we pitched this as a uh, Congress's opportunity that they're not talking about. You know, who knows? It's an experiment. Maybe we'll average two, two newsletter links per send, per, per client placement. Maybe it'll be zero in three months from now, we're not doing it anymore. But at the very least, our clients understand that we're trying to get more than just, hey, the op-ed's done and walk it away. Very smart. And is there a way you're able to express the value of that? I mean, we, you and I sit here and we know the value of the people who are sure. listening to this, know the value, understand, appreciate the value of that. Is there a way you can actually either categorize or measure or demonstrate that value to a client who maybe does not know what we know? So actually, I, I've never put it into a sort of ROI perspective because of what PR is and is not. But what I often will describe is what I just said earlier, you know, get the op-ed up, it's good for four days, you know, or two days or whatever the number is. But unless you add more value to it, it's just sort of hanging out there. And when I say hanging out there, everybody kind of gets it, right? It's on instinct. But then if I say, hey, 
you know, we can get this link. We can try to get these backlinks that, well, yes, it's SEO value, but more than that, uh, we had a client two years ago that for four hours in the whole existence of humanity was linked at uh, a, a political healthcare site above the, an article by the Wall Street Journal and above an article by the Washington Post. It didn't get them a lot of reads. And I know that they got the numbers, but it got a screenshot that they used for an investor presentation later that day. For a brief shining moment, that little trade outlet on my client's topic was more important than the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post for four hours. Well, and the other thing too, and I, I, one of the links I sent you um, as a part of our prep here is you know, small press can often beat big press. And the way we just- Yeah, that's just where clients, I was going. Let's talk about this, right? Yeah, so a lot of our clients, they have very little exposure. And they might have some within their like very tight knit, we call them circles of influence. So it's the you know AI reporters at this specific niche of an industry. You know, then we have to try to expand them out beyond that. And so what we try to point out is that by getting those bigger links, those backlinks, et cetera, it's more it, it's very impressive. But also, I, I believe, and, and I could be wrong. As I said, um, I've never worked in an agency. I've never worked. So what I'm gonna say is something I I believe, but I could be wrong, is I think getting a, a good solid trade outlet is like 80% as credible to a target generally to a target audience as the Wall Street Journal or CNBC, but it's like 12 times easier to place. And they often allow republishing. So there's extra value. That's kind of also how we frame it to our clients is good luck getting in front of the Washington Post on XYZ issue when everyone was talking about uh, this political issue or Wall Street Journal when everyone was talking about AI or whatever. But it's much easier to get into that mid-range trade outlet that allows republishing. We get two republishings in one backlink Plus, you know, we boosted it to a couple of folks who put it up on Twitter. You know, we think that adds additional value. And then clients are impressed by the fact that we're able to point to the influence. because so they usually do these trade outlets. And we can then say, we do these trade outlets for the next six months. Now we have a really good chance about getting into those larger outlets. Yeah, exactly right. And I've used the phrase, the walk-up method, right? You should be, you sure. should be owning the press that you're supposed to be in sort of that, that right in your own backyard kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, wh whatever gonna... that is, whether it's geographically or by subject matter, you're, if, if you're supposed to be in that art, in that outlet, you'll know, get in there and get in there with regularity and then walk your way up towards those more aspirational outlets. I think that's great. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hack in and delete your mention of that. So I can take that phrase and pretend like it was mine originally. So go right, at, go right ahead. <laughs> Everything, you know, I, I give away all the, uh, if I have two secrets, I give them away here on the podcast. <laughs> What's a secret? My, yeah, my wife exactly. is much more, right? my wife is oh, much come on. We, more. Know, we know secret, we know secrets. We know more secrets than we let on, right? Well, <laughs> my, my poor wife, my poor wife. I don't think she quite realized how extroverted I was until well into the relationship. <laughs> so she's had to train me. Um, let's talk to about, um, the industry outlets, um, uh, sure. give me maybe a, a, for instance of someone you've worked with and, and I'll warm you up here. You know, I, I work with plenty of clients whose business it is to be in trade outlets and they work in lots of different areas that have dozens of, you know, industry publications that just talk about what they do, whether it's real estate and construction or nonprofit or, um, you know, even medicine, um, and, and I had one client one time that worked in a, in a very, very specific niche industry area uh, and was able to get him a cover story in the number one trade magazine that serviced that industry that I'll be honest, I never even knew existed before I started working for the guy. <laughs> and, and he later told me that when he sold his company for tens of millions of dollars, that it was that cover article that helped him to seal the deal. I bet. So I believe you that. talk about ROI. There you go. <laughs> did you get a percentage? Did you did you have a Kevin uh, Kevin O'Leary royalty on that? You really, you really think I got a percentage? <laughs> Dustin, come on. So, what's been really interesting is I've always wondered if I have imposter syndrome because I got started in my PR world. It was in in a specific 
side of the political spectrum. I won't say which, you can Google me if you want. Don't though, please. Um, I want my Google rankings to focus on my business, not my past journalism. Um, and I wondered if I could do it outside of the one side of the side that I was on. And then I got a job with the trade association and without any support, there was no one else on the team, but, uh, but I had the title of director. Um, I was able to take them from 200 placements the prior year, mostly a couple of Associated Press quotes that got republished gazillions of times. I got them 1,248 placements by myself. Again, some of those were republishings, but New York Times, Chicago Tribune, NPR stations, trade outlets, sub-trade outlets, like the whole gamut, blogs. And I went, oh, wow, I can really do this. So still, until the last year, most of our clients were still political and we were doing really well. But I wondered, how good am I really at the business side? So as, as, as I've grown the team, we've actually had some new clients that are not in the political space. We had a client to, for eight months that was in the AI space. I didn't know what the term generative AI meant September of last year. On the last day of the contract, and we ended on great terms. On the last day of the contract, I got them an interview, a second interview with a Wall Street Journal reporter in the eight months. And prior to us coming on, they'd had a Harvard Business Review piece, which of course is a great hit, um, but they hadn't had anything for like four months prior to that. So we got them a couple of mid-range hits, just a few pieces out there here and there, and that built up to the Wall Street Journal in eight months. So this has really allowed me to realize, yep, my imposter syndrome is, no, is, is should no longer be a syndrome. Like we can really do this. And again, um, a lot of that was those trade outlets. It built up the credibility it allowed us to say, hey, this outlet's you know, covered this report that they did. Here are two white papers they did on their website. It built that Google roadmap, if we will, the walk up to the Wall Street Journal. Now, I don't know what's happened since then. I don't think they've done an article about it, but it doesn't matter. I can't control what the Wall Street Journal does. I can only control that you know, we got them in front of the journal. You can't, Dustin, you can't guarantee earned media coverage like all of those cold emails that I and my clients get. You can't do that? I... Uh, I haven't yet had to do the uh, the whole uh, earned media, not paid media argument. So far, I've been pretty fortunate. Good for you. I got to tell you, it's it's a it's a laughable argument. And there's a uh, uh, check out PR Twitter. Um, oh, you'll you'll see it crop up right every now and then. It's it it just it seems to go in waves, right? And these these companies seem to crop up all at once. And, and send out these, you know, horrible emails about, we can guarantee you coverage. If you don't, if we don't get oh, you a yeah. hit at Bloomberg, you don't pay us. It's like, you want to throw in a, a, a set of bald tires there too? <laughs> well, I'm very um, fortunate because my business partner is, is a, a longtime startup entrepreneur. He's, he's with us sort of behind the scenes more than anything else. And his specialty is in marketing and branding. He's the other bearded fellow on the company website. And what he helped me understand early on was we are not the used car salesman. It might take a year for someone to hire us and that's okay because we're going after people who have a specific mindset and the used car sales was going to bring in a lot of headache clients who don't want to pay much, who want, who don't understand the difference between the, the, Hey, I don't have any brand, but I want it in the wall street journal anyway. Yeah. Because the wall street journal is in the habit of reporting on people that you've never heard of before. <laughs> Well, even more, they're in the habit of reporting on people who say the same thing as everybody else, but less loudly and with less credibility well, and go. less success. Of course. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. Like the well, it seems like we've got some job security built in here, Dustin. Good. Hey, Tell you wrote a that. great you wrote a great piece uh, uh, that that's posted uh, on your website about can your company survive a shark attack? And uh, here on Long Island, where I live, we seem to be. Uh, uh, breaking our necks to set records for shark attacks, uh, even though you and I both agreed that sharks just be doing what sharks be doing. Uh, right. Tell us about uh, the, the analogy you were making there about can your company survive a shark attack? What were you getting at there? Sure. So about 12, I guess 14 months ago, I happened to see an article about two shark attacks that happened, I think, four days apart. One was to a lifeguard and one was like 300 miles away, but it was still reported as New York beaches, quote unquote, or Long Island beaches or something. And I looked into it. And what happened was a lifeguard was attacked by a small shark, a three, three or four footer, 
he got he was relatively fine. It was on a I think it was on a Saturday that the attack happened while the lifeguard was doing a lesson. Well, th- what they immediately did, all the officials, they closed the beach. They let everyone out. The beach is closed. Don't come back. 24 hours later, they reopened the beaches with the lifeguards showing up an hour early. Binoculars from the, the beach, extra lifeguards, and everybody was paddling. The lifeguards were paddling around to look at the sharks. Now, I couldn't find statistics on whether numbers were down for the summer because there were several, shark, I think, three shark attacks along those beaches last summer. But I also didn't see any articles saying, oh my God, tourism crashed on the beaches, which indicated to me that probably the numbers didn't sink much, if at all. So I just, I wrote this piece that, when I turned it actually into a presentation to a business group earlier this year, I had this big splashy shark the size of, you know, my, my body on the, on, the, on the slide in front of everybody when they came into the event, is can your company survive a potentially catastrophic thing Maybe you couldn't control, or maybe you could. Maybe you're a an out and loud Christian CEO, and you were caught cheating on your wife. Well, that that's going to be a, hit, a shark attack on your personal brand. Or maybe you are a payroll company. Or actually, here's a good example: the Ernst and Young uh, cheating scandal. Maybe you're an Ernst and Young competitor, one of the other big four accounting firms, and there's a cheating scandal, a hundred million dollar fine from the I think it was the SEC against Ernst and Young. Well, that might be a shark attack on the credibility of your industry. And you know any number of other examples, so I've turned this into a five or five to six step crisis communications response based upon what what actually government officials did of all of all people to actually respond effectively to a crisis. Yeah, you want to share some of those steps there? That they're, they're really great and they're and they're really tightly written. So why don't you step through them for us? Sure. Um, what I'm going to do is cheat and go to my actual link because I don't have them all memorized off the top of my head. Uh, shouldn't, that's a shark attack right there, my reputation. Um, I don't have my own stuff memorized. Um, so first, officials didn't hide the information, right? Really couldn't. The media was already reporting on it. So they were as transparent as they could be. They shared relevant data, which ended up being good news. So they shared that the injured lifeguard would recover and that no shark attack had been recorded in some, you know, since they started looking like 55 years earlier, whatever the number was. Third, they took prompt actions. So again, they were transparent. They shared relevant data that also included good news. They took prompt actions by shutting the beach down. They had developed and announced concrete next steps and then executed the next steps. As I mentioned earlier, extra lifeguards paddling around using binoculars. And the, the key here, I think, for a lot of companies is, or a lot of even uh, political campaigns, you know, right? We're, we're about to enter the, officially enter the 2024 season with the debate coming up in two weeks. One, I think I'm, I tend to default to transparency. And yes, you don't have to tell everything to the world, but if you're more transparent than not, there, people are going to trust you more. Uh, the opposite happened with United Airlines in 2017 when their CEO tried to blame the, uh, um, the passenger who got beat up, I think, seven times before admitting he was wrong. Just say you screwed up. The Catholic Church tried to hide you know, clergy abuse. People understand that people will screw up and do bad things and do unethical things. It's the cover-up that usually makes it worse. So that's, I think, always, one of the big mistakes. Always makes it worse. It always makes it worse. And then second is lacking concrete steps. Um, I, I, the, the, the lack of concrete steps will kill people's trust in your recovery. You can be transparent. You can do all the other things. But if it sounds like you're just saying something generic that has no substance behind it, no one's going to trust you especially if you haven't been through this before. So another thing we talk about with the shark attack is preparing ahead of time, right? Building a trust reservoir so that, again, I'm, I'm going to mix my analogies here, build a trust reservoir um, because there's a drought in the Midwest, um, Colorado and somewhere else. It's a long, long stretch of water. And there are two reservoirs that have been sipped at for 30 years. And they still have more than, I think, 78% in one case of their water left. Because they didn't fill the reservoir in 19, you know, whatever it was, 88, the year before the drought hit. They built it in 1946 and they filled it. So I'm going to mix my analogies. Have your trust reservoir so when a shark attack sips at the reservoir, you still have water left so you can keep plowing forward. There you go. And, And it's a great point, too, in those six steps of yours. It strikes me that probably 
only half or less than half are about saying stuff and more than half are about doing stuff. And, and we right. all know that good press follows good actions. And if you don't have good actions, nobody can tell everybody else what those actions are. It can't be reported on. So, so yeah, right. great point that you bring up there and some really terrific steps urge everybody to, uh, to check that out because it's a great analogy, but it's also a great six step process. Uh, on responding to crisis and love the analogy of the trust reservoir. I, I completely agree with you. Good. I'm glad. I guess I was right. I, I'm, I'm getting really go. validated. The problem is I'm not going to be able to fit through the door to leave my office for dinner, but my ego is going to be so big. So I'm really concerned here, Jody. That's okay. We'll pump you up for the weekend. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do now. Maybe we'll embarrass you a little bit, Dustin. We're going to segue now into the rapid fire question portion of our All podcast, right. where we steal a page from inside the actor studio, ask our guests a series of rapid fire questions meant to elicit a simple answer, maybe a laugh or two, maybe even some embarrassment. Let's just go for it. What do you say? With your indulgence, Dustin Siggins, rapid fire question number one, what is your favorite news source? Ooh, that's a really good one. Um, Probably, I don't really have a favorite news source, but I would say Real Clear Politics is main page, gives me an idea of what's popping that day, and then I can find news around that. And then maybe politico.com because I'm still a political addict. Yep, absolutely. A regular stop for me every morning, too. Rapid fire question number two What is your favorite social media platform? Done. I hate social media. I use it. Are you almost are you able to are you able to stay away from it or do you have to look at I get it I get it you want to use it yourself but are you do you still have to look for at it for your clients? So I do use it. I, mean, I use LinkedIn for my business. I use Twitter to a degree for my clients. Facebook used to be my favorite until I just realized how much life it was sucking away from me because I uh, didn't. I started having a family and realized I can't be debating this stuff until eleven p.m. What am I doing? So I, I do think in the in the big picture we're going to conclude that social media has a net negative effect on society. Thus, why I philosophically, yes, it has benefit. None of them are my favorite. Uh, I, I will agree with you, but for the channels run by um, The Dad, have you checked those out since we're both dads? No, I haven't seen this. Oh, uh, it's, 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 it's the gift that keeps for? on giving for us guys. Yeah, no, it's just the, <laughs> at The Dad. Just go for it. <laughs> I'm looking it up right now. I'll look at it when there you're you done. There you go. There you go. You let me know while we answer rapid fire question number three, Dustin, coffee or alcohol? Coffee brings me more benefit and I'm a lightweight because I drink about six times a year. There you go. Rapid fire question number four. What's your favorite on the run food? You got four kids under the age of five. You're always on the run. What are you gobbling? Ooh. I'm going to make sure I share this episode with my friend, RJ Caster. RJ uh, once thought the way I was looking around, I had drugs or something. We were at a restaurant. I, not without that didn't have the healthiest food. I pulled out a Ziploc bag with chopped up carrots, spinach, and chicken. I used to work out a lot, so I would pack up all these really healthy foods. I would say chicken breast with spinach and, and carrots in a Ziploc bag is my favorite on, on the go food. Good stuff. I usually play a, a game when I go out to dinner with my family. I usually play a game called Peak Dad, where I let them order, and there's always stuff left over. So I just eat whatever's left. See, I'm too OCD for that. I can't do that. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, you go. <laughs> I mean, it's like very expensive in our household. <laughs> I Well, for, for, four kids under the age of five. Yes. I got to imagine. Yeah, true. Rapid true. fire question. Rapid fire question number five. Let's close it out with what do you want to be after you finish this career? Sure. I would love to, and this could be volunteer if I'm able to sell my company for enough money, or this could be a, a next career path. I don't know. I, I, in my head and somewhat on, on paper, wrote two books related to, uh, one is Catholic dating and one is more about the social aspects of Catholic dating. Um, the other one is 10 things I wish society and the church had taught me about marriage. So I really want to write two books related to um, being religious in society and living in the world, not of the world. And I also through running a business have become pretty good at diving into people's pain points and solving them. So I think I'd want to volunteer my time and like six hours on a Saturday, you know, at a coffee shop, put it out there, come talk to Dustin about your resume problem or your financial problem or whatever. Like I really like people. I really like helping people and I'm a busy body. So it fits my personality really well. 
That sounds like a good post-career career to me, Dustin. This has been a great conversation. Please let everybody know how they can find you online. Sure. ProvenMediaSolutions.net or .com. Proven Media Solutions. Uh, uh, LinkedIn, Dustin Siggins is only liking one of me on the whole platform. Um, and uh, likewise on Twitter. Sounds good, Dustin. Thanks again for uh, being on the show today. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the show. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at The PR Podcast and send us a question or a comment. Our intro is by Christopher Appolt. You can find him and his fantastic photography on Instagram at Christopher underscore A-P-P-O-L-D-T. Check him out there and hire him for all your photography needs. You can find me online at Jody Fisher on all the socials and on the web at JodyFisherPR.com. We'll see you next time on the PR Podcast.